All right. I will go first. Okay. Three. Look at you. Off to the side. Very from the side. Go. Joining us on the drill today is one of Nigerian finest and brilliant mind. He's a human rights activist or pro democracy com campaigner. He's the founder of an online agency, Sahara Reporters. And today we're going to be finding out exactly his plans, his agenda, and also what exactly he's tending to offer the Nigerian people. So joining us today is Mr. Omoyele Shore. It's nice to have you on the drill, sir. Thank you so much for bringing me. Yeah, uh, let's start from your early life um, as an SUG president. Uh, you were one of the people who, who led and was also part of the of demonstration about the IMF. Uh, for let, let's talk about that. How was it like as, as a young star then, and then engaging yourself into uh, an act of politics? Well, so we we had structural adjustment program as the economic policy government, uh, as the economic economics governance structure for Nigeria during that time, and we also had military rule. And uh, I was the first year student when Femi Falano, lawyer Femi Falano came to campus and addressed us and said, look, we're about to be giving $120 million loan to f fix our university, you know, but this is a gimmick to find a way to reduce the number of universities at that time. Because they are in a targeted public service or um, social services to the poor, and they want free education for students. They didn't want free water. They want everything privatized. And they felt that, you know, the universities in Nigeria were too many. The government didn't spend more money on universities. The private sector can grab the university system or university education and make money off of us. So for us, we just decided that this is wrong. I came from a poor home. I knew if the IMF policy were to sail through at that time, I will probably not be in the university. So we organized ourselves and uh, started talking to students and one day we went out to protest. It was uh, one of my first protests and I was excited to find out that we had so much power to influence you know, uh, government policy. And of course, it didn't take long before it turned very ugly. So was that was that the beginning of because I know of base and um, you started geography and planning. And, uh, and yeah. planning. Yeah. So at the time we were doing the protests, was there when you discovered that you were called to be a, a human rights activist? Yeah, I think I grew over time and you know became active politically on campus. And so I was part of a lot of underground movements. You know, there was this Thomas Shankara movement at that time, fashion after a former president of uh, former military president of Burkina uh, Faso, Thomas Sankara, who was seen to be this very honest and upright leader who was assassinated by Blas Kampora, his deputy. So we had that movement that, you know, we had a way of connecting with the outside world and that exposure of knowing that, you know, there's a lot of power in organizing, even though we're young, we're very idealistic about the future, uh, made me to build myself into a political activist on campus. Speaking about yeah, the, the fighting and then standing up as, um, as a human rights activist to, to lend your voice to some people, um, contrary to what you're saying, some people feel um, you were in some part of fraternity or a court who was trying to stand up to fight another rival. Uh, could that be true? Or? No, no, that's not correct. Uh, so, courtism came later on. So, as we were doing Senate Union activism, we were fighting against military rule formed a very strong pro-democracy group through the National Association of Nigerian Students. The military government had its own agenda as well. They saw this, you know, the students or campuses as too uh, confrontational. And subtly, they started introducing court gangs into the campuses as a way of distracting attention from social political issues happening in town. So that they can say, hey, you know, the, the problems had, the students have a problem of gangsterism. So we can bring in police, we can arrest them. 
So when they came to the University of Lagos and we started detecting that, whenever we were doing protests, there's a bunch of guys who would uh, come and say, no, we don't want protests, we want to graduate. We thought it was an expression of fundamental rights at the beginning. But over time we discovered that there were drug gangs. And uh, because they were trying to fight for tough uh, control over our campus, they also forced themselves apart, you know, and uh, a lot of stabbing, a lot of rapes reported to be seen. And, and we decided that, hey, you know, if you're fighting the appearance outside, because most of the court guys were children of the rich and mm -hmm. military guys, that we better just confront these guys on campus as well. So, so our student union uh, leadership decided to have an active call position at the University of So at this point, you were in scared of your life, you probably thought you could have put it also for... I knew, I knew what I signed up for the moment I started confronting the military. You know, the Nigerian military is the biggest court <laughs> in Africa at that time. So if you're fighting them, you might as well just do other things that would be quite Could it be maybe because you were so of a born and maybe probably raised at the Niger Delta and that would flinch your aggressiveness? It's possible, it's possible. A lot of people have attributed me, you know, my activity to coming from one of those states where they say you have the largest concentration of stubborn people in Nigeria. You know, some people say it's because I have the Niger Delta blood, you know, my blood is hot and things like that. But I think it's a matter of the opportunity to develop my conscience over time, you know. You know, I I had a very well internalized, I'm sorry, internalized lifestyle. <laughs> and I studied things, I decided what I wanted to do, even when my parents thought, you know, uh, the other way about issues, I took a different position, even though I don't always physically or openly express them. So over time, it's not as if I became an activist by way of just coming to the university. University was a place where I had a chance to fully and openly express my activism. I'd always been somehow, you know, an activist in my secondary school because of the injustices I saw in the Niger Delta region. Now, now, now yeah. talking about your activism, or uh, uh, we're going to come back to the area of education because mm -hmm. while you were in school, you knew exactly what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. But before that, uh, we discover in your course of fighting as an activist during um, 1992 and 1994, mm -hmm. you were part of the people who ensure that James Ibori and the likes of uh, Emmanuel and the likes of, um, of Senator um, Yabo uh, of Asunjo mm -hmm. and also the EFCC boss, speaking of El Waziri, mm -hmm. uh, were, were part of the people uh, who, who, who you were exposed and brought them to the light. And, and uh, how were you able to do that? Because one of the campaigns is, is about corruption yeah. that you kept fighting. No, that Let's was not that. 1992, 1994 was a different battle that was to drive the military out of power. Ibori and Yabo and Eduaga and the rest of the corrupt elements that were exposed were done after we established Sahara Reporters in 2006. So when Sahara Reporters' position was that, you know, we need to expose all the corrupt people in the country who have held this country to ransom and made the country and its people, in, you know, uh, unable to progress. They've denied us all the prosperity we deserve, you know, the quality of life that we need. Uh, so that was Sahara Reporters, which I've done for 12 years. But 1992 to 1994 was, you know, that chapter of my life was fighting for democracy, fighting for Abiola to become president when the election was annulled by the military. And of course, the cult aspect as well, where we confronted cult uh, members and cult, cult gangs on campus. Yeah. So ever since then, fighting um, um, the military regime for the June 12th, um, and all, and then, um, and um, um, have you been able to now? Um, because the fight of corruption is something that is ongoing to now. Would you want to see from that time to now? Because it seems like corruption is growing by the day. Uh, um, you are flagging for the chief executive of Nigeria. How do you intend to be able to fight and to cop corrupt and corrupt offices? No, it's um, it's all of it is the same in a way. Because if you look at it, military rule is a corruption of a political process, right? And the corruption that has taken hold in Nigeria to this started during the military era. In fact, it has been said several times that it was President, uh, former military President Babangida, you know, Ibrahim Babangida was one who started, he was the innovator of the corruption that had destroyed Nigeria. And that's true. So we knew this corruption was starting, you know. 
the corruption, the autism we saw at campuses fester because of the corrupt political system on campuses, uh, and also the police. So I hope there's no battle that we fought that didn't have something to do with common corruption over these years, right? So to become the chief executive of Nigeria, I came to that conclusion knowing that you can fight corruption all you want as a loner, you know, as a one man, a one man army, you know, but if you do a better job if you are the president of the country, because then you can call it. You are the commander in chief of all the. When you say a better job, what do you mean? Because you, you kept you, you kept talking and uh, about um, um stopping the bribe um done by policemen and all that, and then you mentioned about doing a better job. How do you intend to do a better job to to fix up the regulating body to ensure? Yes. That all all corrupt practice. So so the, so the president of the country is the chief executive officer of the country. Is that the CEO of your company? Decisions they mandate from the office of the CEO that can make a lot of things happen. The only difference between the CEO and the president of the country is probably the fact that the CEO don't have you know an elected parliament. They have a board. But in this case, we work with all the three arms of government. And I'm the one who's going to appoint the EFCC chairman, for example, as president of Nigeria. I'm the one who can make an executive order to get a lot of things rectified. I'm the one who can say to this, you know, EFCC chairman, I close my eyes. You are free to do whatever investigation you want to do and prosecute for whoever you want, because I don't want anybody to steal a dime from the country. I'm the one who can wake up in the morning and look for some of the best judges. But, but, I, but, I, but as, 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 as civilized as most Western countries are, there's still corruption. Do you think you can oh, make that not happen in Nigeria as well? There, there's corruption everywhere. If you watch me over the years, in fact, I said it recently, the most corrupt streets, not local government now, not states, not country, streets in the world is in America. It's called Wall Street. So I understand the dynamics of corruption. But our own corruption here is not that type of corruption. Our own is primitive accumulation. You understand? In the US, it's likely that corrupt people will construct a road or get a road contract. It will be done. In fact, it will be done before the date of delivery, most of the time, 95% of the time. But in Nigeria, the contractor of the road. His job is to ensure that the road is not completed, it's not done. You understand what I'm saying? That's been my that's been my experience as a Nigerian. So we cannot be comparing you know corruption. That is also to say that assuming the whole world is corrupt and they are doing business the wrong way, Nigeria has a duty to show example to the world as a country you can go to that is not corrupt. So we cannot be justifying our corruption by comparing it with so you know, how we are doing with Ghana. Are we more corrupt than Ghana or Burma or Malaysia? No. We have a duty to say, look, as Nigerians, every dime that is meant for our people is invested in our people and is not stolen by a rich man. That is where I am. That's where I stand. But how I'm not here to make comparison between Nigeria and the rest of the world. But no, I'm here know. to make Nigeria better by yeah. ensuring that all the thieves in this country who are still what we want to learn now, who have made it impossible for kids to get immunization when they are growing up, made it impossible for you to go to hospitals that you deserve to go to. Yeah. Roots, that you just said up that all the thieves, but yeah. your amazing statement, um, they said virtually all Nigerians are corrupt. And then we also see where the poor in this very country also oppress the poor. Yeah. So yeah. how do you intend to fight about that? who are not corrupt have a duty to show to the world that they can make their country better. You can make generalized statements about any country. You can say that every Italian is in the mafia. Does it make it correct? No. You know, you can say that you know all Americans are stupid. It doesn't mean that all Americans are stupid. That, that's your opinion. What I'm saying here is that not all Nigerians are corrupt. Not all Nigerians are interested in stealing what belongs to the majority. It's a minority. Actually, you, you know, it's true that the poor oppress the poor everywhere. It happens everywhere, but you have to define what oppression can, does it, you know, what, how do the poor oppress the poor. Again, come back to my advice, though. 
you don't have to have a country where we compare, you know, where we make those and how it is. Yes, it's not necessary because at the end of the day, it doesn't fetch you a kilometer of the road when you compare your corruption with that. That has been the internalization of justification of wrong that the elite in Nigeria has made popular, you know, with the masses. It's they've made it. They've done a good job of using us to defend. You know our, our terrible objective conditions. So it's likely that you find could, 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 could that the person who would justify corruption of any political office holder on Facebook has never found a job in his life. But could could we portion this to maybe probably our way of life in terms of our culture? Because we grew up in a country where they were told they told you that um, even when people are infringing on your rights, you can't speak, and then um, you give respect to who respects you. No, it's people. not true. You know, when people say that, it's also a generalization and a fallacy. Have you heard about uh, Obama Baisi Oborawa before? Heard about him? As an Obama in Benin. Years ago, when the colonial masters were coming around and taking slaves, he opposed them individually. So Nigeria has had a history of people who opposed oppression. Have you heard about the Abba riots of 1929? Tied up by women in Abba because they were opposed to taxes, right? Have you heard about, you know, uh, Mrs. Ransom Kuti, Kumla Ransom Kuti, that's the last mom, who deposed an Abba, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who have stood up from time to time in this country to oppose oppression. So our culture, if our culture were to be that subservient, then how would a woman have helped to depose a traditional ruler to whom everybody must bow when they wake up and, you know, uh, say okay, I mean, pray uh, before they go to bed. So it's not true. What has happened to our society is that they've destroyed the society over time by attacking it from all sides. And for us to, you know, get up and move the society in the very right direction, we must, as a rule, just escape from all those internal incoherencies or dummies that have been sold to us, people, things that have been planted in our consciousness, to say, well, you know, we have no right to do this. We have rights to do it, and we have always exercised our rights. Even before our constitution was formed, people exercise their rights in this country because it's about human dignity. All right? Let's, let's, let's also maybe talk about your, your, your campaign for, for the presidency. And then, um, but we know that politics is more like a clash of ideas, yes. and the best idea tends to win. Not what, here. What, 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 what fresh <laughs> idea? What fresh idea uh, do you think you're bringing at, at this point in time? Because Every idea I'm bringing is fresh. Not what fresh ideas. I so, bring. so what are those ideas? So our idea about how to tackle security is fresh, because it has, you know, dimensions raised really that's generally about the efficient of technology. If you read the newspapers this morning, you must have heard that the government is saying that they want they are using drones now to fight Boko Haram. I've been talking about drones for eight months, not only to fight Boko Haram but to also fight headsmen. You know, it's not and this in some cases are civilian drones. I've also proposed the use of drone to do agriculture. Why? Because probably you've been to a farm where somebody puts a bucket of water in his back and mix it with chemicals and it's fumigating, right? It takes forever to fumigate one hectare of land. You can hook the same you know, payload on a drone and set it out and go to it. And by the time the drone is back 30 minutes later, it's fumigated a whole farmland. You understand what I'm saying? So what about our plan to generate electricity? It's fresh. Renewable energy, solar farms, not solar panels, solar farms that can generate enough energy that we can even sell to the outside world. So it's not, it not only has a you know, local domestic use, it has a commercial value to it. When we talk about infrastructure, how do we want to build roads? Of course, it also has fresh ideas to it. You know, it has the duplication of the existing road. We have a plan to make sure that every region is linked by dual carriageway. So we have an interstate highway system. It's fresh. Nobody has ever done it before. You know, when we talk about fighting corruption, and we said we want every office in Nigeria 
that's owned by the Federal Good Faith and entitled to get your fingerprints uh, to open the door or your retina recognition uh, uh, technology. That is fresh. Nobody is doing that. Have you ever been to an office owned by the federal government in Nigeria? You find, you know, it's fingerprinted entrance or exit system. That will totally eliminate those workers right there and makes it possible for you to pay only people who come to work. Right. You all, know, all of this, because, all yeah. of this is saying, how does it translate to uh, 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 an average man in the street who is looking so for an average, to himself? Yeah. So back. And so an average man. On the street, do we benefit from food security, right? Because I'll give you an example of drone application, for example. So, what will be done in five days is done in 30 minutes. So, you are growing your corn or you are growing tomato. The tomato doesn't get infected anymore, it doesn't, you know, you don't have like low cost eating them up because they have drones I can do that. I'm just giving drone alone as an example. So, your harvest is secured in three months. You're able to make your money because you have a market to sell. The roads we build will take you to the market. The railway will take will reduce the amount of time you waste from uh, yeah, on the shop. So just mentioning the road and the way we making yeah. it sound like it's just an easy project. It is for so the space easy. of one year. It is easy. Before we got on, yeah, I told you that when you want to construct a road, right, three basic things are needed. That's fresh construction. You know, the designer of the roads. Person who is going to build the roads, you know, with the mechanics and I mean the mechanisms involved, including machines, and the supervisor who, you know, the engineer supervisor who comes and says the road is high quality, it's done, and we ride on it. But in Nigeria, we ask the contractor to come and, come and construct the road. Even if the other people are doing their part, the contractor will say, no, 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 don't finish the road. I need to go and collect more money from, you know, uh, I don't know if you have ever listened to fellas son look and laugh. It's there where he says, you know, contractor go government specs, you know, the road is not done. So what I'm trying to say is that we have become so, you know, demoralized over the years uh, to the point that we are not even having the conversations that we should be having in government. So every government that comes to, everybody that wants to be president is promising roads, whereas it's not even the job of the president to construct roads. It's supposed to be institutionalized by now. You cannot find an American president anywhere cutting ribbons of the highway that has just been constructed. Never. But you can't find a local government chairman, you know, cutting ribbons on a highway. Because the way the commission road is to open it up for use. Right? But here, yeah, you know, it's part of what saddens me is that the quality of conversation should be centered on the on quality of life, not basic existence, you know. We are talking as if we are still in nineteen sixty, you know, it's like, oh how can you construct roads? You know, how can we get borehole in our village? When other countries have set up in a country as big as Nigeria, there's already a very underground pipelines that will last that will bring water to everywhere for the next fifty years. So have you ever asked yourself about the fact that people are still using gas cylinders to get gas to cook in Nigeria. In other parts of the world, you don't use gas cylinders. What do you use? They have gas piped into every house. I think even the Libya government tends to work. Exactly. And that is big deal economically. Because a lot of things will be booming. You know, the gas companies in Nigeria, there's plenty of gas in Nigeria, but because we haven't piped them into houses, people don't even have access to that. So you can cook your house, you can cook your food without having to worry. You just need to buy the infrastructure and place in the house. One boat and not, you have gas coming in. So could this be uh, as a form of um, maybe policies or wrong decision making? The it's not wrong decision government. making, it's incompetent people, right? People, these guys who are running Nigeria are incompetent bunch of people. They don't know what they are doing, they don't know how the rest of the world is working. Even when they go to international conferences, they just go open their mouth, laugh, you know, buy computers, clothes, and come back. You know, you know the history of attendance of conferences, you know. But what I'm saying is that with a person who is knowledgeable about this and how they work, you will not be asking questions about roads in the next election. You'll be asking, how many, you know, uh, gigabytes of 
internet now we're getting you know for this country too when you're asking quality of life questions i'm just using that as an example because i i make fun of people i make it a joke to say that under our government wi-fi will become a fundamental human right it will be your right to have internet everywhere in the country so which is true uh, on a serious note so we should move to having quality of life conversation about governance not this whole question about we're stuck that's the truth so we have to break free from the past and move very quickly to the future into the future but speaking about the future um what will you do to be able to reposition nigeria in a global economy because we see um, the use of digital technology information mm -hmm. technology and um, we could see um, that every nation seems to be leveraging on that mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's more like uh, we, we are far behind so what will you do if you become the president to be able to to reposition nigeria in such a globalized economy so just to support your position about how the rest of the world is moving technologically if you look at even the western stock markets today the first five companies that are doing the best do you know them they're amazon, tech companies amazon yes facebook tech companies right so that supports your assertion that the rest of the world is moving in the right direction using leveraging on technology but we are not we are not because we are stuck in the past we have analog leaders analog brained leaders they cannot manage a digital society they don't understand how digitalization works they don't understand technology you know they are still interested in you know subsistence farming rotational farming you know you know those things we used to teach us in class one in agriculture and that cannot take us to the next level because we need to we need to become competitors you know in the global market and you cannot participate in the global market without technology you can't participate let me say without electricity you must be able to produce something or perish that's it's as simple as that that's the game out there in the global space and we're not participants in it because you know look at all the rankings we have just become we, we recently became the uh, poverty capital of the world I think three days ago we became and we got another award of becoming the country where people mm -hmm. terrorist group in Shokoto yesterday that has been collecting taxes well armed in Shokoto. So what is next? So now about the, the globalization. Don't I talk. just told you, you, yeah. want to, you want to be a player in the global space. Yeah. Yeah. You have to invest in your people. You have to have electricity. You have to have infrastructure that promotes technological <laughs> development, drive technological development. And you have to have educational institution that can make that happen as well. You understand what I mean? So because Facebook did not come from the US government. It came from an individual. In the, you know who started it in the university you know if facebook started in the university in nigeria they probably would have killed the guy you know because the religious groups would say ah this is going to bring a market and how can you create a platform where people put on photos of themselves in underwear they say they are still fighting fans for for releasing a record of this is nigeria Music has been banned. Exactly. They ban every progressive idea in Nigeria will be banned. They will kill it. So uh, our society needs leaders who are open minded enough to recognize technology. That's why we said we will um, honestly create a society where there will be an innovator, I mean sorry, an, an innovation officer, a national innovation officer who can tap into the talents of young people, whatever they may be. Now about about speaking about the young people that that would probably lead me to the entertainment industry mm -hmm. uh, we saw during the time of uh, president obama but one of the things he did was be able to tap into the entertainment industry using endorsement uh, from the light of the uh, the black american artists and uh, i noticed in your campaign um there been sort of a break of communication maybe between you and um, some of these uh, our entertainers entertainers are 
you know, in Nigeria, there are commodities in the market. They are not driven by ideas. Yes, they get everybody to accept them with love their sons, but the moment they become popular, they commoditize their conscience. So they, they are only available for the highest bidders. So we approached a few of them and only Sheon Kuti, Sheon Kuti, I'm standing here, agreed to have something to do with, uh, with us without asking for it. And every other person, you know, okay, Africa, China, we met also with uh, Idris Abu Karim, uh, but the rest of them, you know, they wanted money. And they're not looking for small money, they're looking for serious money. If I start spending that kind of money, when I become president, I'll become a thief. Because I have to pay myself back or pay the godfathers who lend me that kind of money. I can't do that. You understand what I'm saying? So I understand that I've commoditized their conscience. And I've seen that with you without uh, inhibition. They are lining up behind the Tiku. Whomever Tiku cannot grab, will be grabbed by Buhari. That's it. Yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's begin to put this on the wrap. Um, mm -hmm. Now we know the election is drawing eye, but February is coming. Yeah. So um, I know you basically might be traveling to all the parts uh, to be able to. I ensure. started traveling. I, I just came from the, came back from the Northwest. I did Kano, Jigawa, Sokoto, and Zamfara already. So how, do we, so how do we begin to work? There are a lot of Nigerians you two are out there who are saying, okay, based on what has happened over time, they will not cast um, their, their civil right. And um, by not doing that, it tends to be more like a shortage in supporting younger minds like you. So how do you intend to convince them to come out? And no, you should understand the power they have. We just found out that of all the 82 million voters are just, that are now officially registered to vote next year, almost 70% of them are young. That's about 40 million, no, sorry, more than 40 yeah, million, yeah, that's that's it. 50 something million. If they all vote for a candidate who will take them to El Dorado, <laughs> we don't even need to count the votes before we declare the results. It will be so overwhelming, and that's what I hope they do. A lot of them are registered, but a lot of them are being confused by a few smart alex within the youth community who are collecting money from the big politicians and confusing them. You know, for example, like I said before, if you are educated, if you are literate and you are articulating, you are not educated. All right, in that case, it's going to be a <laughs> fascinating, anybody supporting it's going to be a fascinating way to yeah. draw the curtain yeah. and um, to say, um, uh, thank you so much for being part of the drill. Thank uh, you. We look forward to, um, to see what happens come February and um, let's see how you intend to take Nigeria back. It will happen. It will happen. I can guarantee you that that you know this this is a revolution that must happen. Nigeria is over over due for it, and we are determined to make it happen in our lifetime. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on the show.